welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the coordinator for SFE with the University of Florida. Today I'm excited to have our online guest speakers, Angie Carl with the Nature Conservancy and Brian Wiebler with Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. Angie and Brian will be giving two presentations today that will synthesize their experiences and lessons learned from hosting some very successful public fire festivals in North Carolina and in Florida. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today. Angie Carl is the Coastal Fire and Restoration Manager for the Nature Conservancy in North Carolina. Angie has worked for the Nature Conservancy on the Southern Coast protecting longleaf for over 14 years. She manages two landscapes currently and leads the protection and restoration efforts on those two areas. She attended Purdue University and has a BS in forestry and she lives and works in the Wilmington, North Carolina area. Our second speaker, Brian Wiebler, is the Red Hills Outreach and Education Coordinator for Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. Before joining Tall Timbers two years ago, Brian spent 10 years working on environmental planning and urban design with local government, one year in the nonprofit world as an urban forester, and seven years doing habitat restoration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He lives and works in Tallahassee, Florida. So welcome, Angie and Brian. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we are excited about your presentation. So one moment, I'll stop sharing my screen, and we will bring up Brian's presentation. He'll be going first today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Well, my name is Brian Wiebler, and I'm here at Tall Timbers. And uh, uh, Angie and I talked about how to kind of lay this out for you today. And we decided that I would go ahead and go first because uh, we have a much younger fire festival than Angie has had. And um, so I'm going to kind of go over some of what we've been learning, uh, getting started and planning fire festivals, uh, some of the event components that we're using, uh, and some of the results and feedback that we've gotten. Again, we've just completed our second year of doing a fire festival, uh, and we are now going to be moving into doing our fire festival every other year. Um, we started in 2017. Uh, we had about 600 folks show up. Uh, this past January in 2018, uh, we got it up to about 950 folks. And uh, now we're going to move to a January 25th, 2020 for our next event. Uh, that's mostly to get off cycle with another event that we host here at Tall Timbers every other year. Um, uh, each of these fire festivals has been hosted at Tall Timbers. Uh, we host it kind of a midday, uh, 11 to 3. Uh, and Tall Timbers is a very rural location. Um, Angie's going to be talking about a more urban location for a fire festival. We are kind of 20 minutes away from anything here at Tall Timbers, uh, about a 20 minute drive from Tallahassee, Florida, with a population of 200,000, and about a 20 minute drive from Thomasville, Georgia, with a population of 20,000. My biggest advice to folks who want to start a fire festival is to get your team together. Uh, doing a team approach uh, when, you're, when you're running one of these things and you have other jobs that you're also taking care of, uh, you really got to spread this around. And so uh, picking a team, you know, uh, some good leaders in your area that have some capacity to do this, getting uh, representation from some of the important partners in your area, and then uh, really getting some responsibility out to those folks to take on parts of the event for you uh, is really important. Um, and if you're uh, if you bring in the uh, the Longleaf Alliance, you may even get lucky and have an appearance by Bob the Burner, uh, who showed up at our event last year, which was really great. Again, providing folks with responsibility for different parts of the event really helps to spread the burden of doing one of these things out a lot. However, if you're in the coordinator position, I think that you really need to be following up uh, with a solid planning document, uh, something where you're tracking all of the different components of the event and who's responsible for what and, and how that's all gonna come together. Um, we've had great success 
um, letting people run with the ideas and the fun of getting the event going, uh, and then having me sit back in the coordinator position, uh, just making sure that all of those parts and pieces that folks are coming with um, come together. A, a really important first step with your planning group is to talk about why you're doing it. Um, and this, the, your event goals, you know, we wrote these right at the top of our planning document. And it, it was important for us to kind of have that discussion up front of uh, why are we doing this? Why are we spending our time and efforts on this? We all have lots of things to be doing. Um, so why this? And so we set our goals. Uh, you could have a lot more specific goals. Um, uh, this is really open to be tailored to your fire festival, uh, but it's a really important step in planning. From there, it's good to move into how are you going to do it as far as you, know, you set these goals and then where are you going to take this? And so, you know, for ours, it was very much looking at an all ages event because this was general public outreach. Uh, we wanted to create um, a very approachable atmosphere where folks can come in and learn in whatever way works for them. So uh, my goal when we were thinking about all the different components was thinking about different scales of groups, different scales and depths of information that folks can have access to so that they can get together and, and find what works for them to learn something about prescribed fire. Partners are, are absolutely key. Um, I very much viewed it as we had two groups. We had the core group that was um, the, the partner set doing the planning for the event, but then we had all of the different partners that were participating in the event. Uh, in 2018, we had 30 partners working together on this. And I think that stretching the connection to prescribed fire is, is a great thing to do to bring in other partners because when you, you know, if your goal is general public outreach, each of these different groups has a different subgroup that follows them. And so by involving them in your group, you're accessing their network of people. So for example, um, the Hare Street chapter of the North American Butterfly Association wasn't the first thing that popped into my head as a partner for this, but it turned out to be a great connection for the habitat that the butterflies need. And they had a, a whole group of people that because of their love of butterflies was primed to come in and learn more about prescribed fire. It's also important to look at some volunteer groups to help you out. Um, you're gonna have a lot of talent running around in the circles that you know well, and you wanna use that talent where you can in the event, uh, but you also need some labor to come in and help work the event. Uh, our first event, we used a college class uh, a communications class that was working with Tall Timbers. Um, this past year, we used a uh, high school student government association, adopted the event as their semester volunteer project. Uh, and that worked out great, you know, because there's, there's water stations, there's trash, there's parking circulation. Um, there's a lot of different things um, that having kind of a dedicated volunteer group uh, to come in and, and fill in all those holes and have a lot of extra bodies uh, available at the event. Um, it is great. And again, each time you involve one of these groups, you're tapping into another group of people that they can be spreading the word to and bringing people to your event. Budget for the Red Hills Fire Festival in 2018 was $4,000. Uh, it was $3,000 for our first year. Um, you can just kind of look at this slide and get an idea of where we were spending our money. Uh, the tents, tables, and chairs was a big part of our cost. Uh, and that was a decision to make it um, as easy as possible for our partner groups to come in and set up. Uh, so this was something where they didn't have to come in and bring tables and chairs and their tents. Uh, we had that all set up for them so they could just bring in their materials and show up uh, to participate. That was the model we wanted to go with. Uh, I think that you know each of these events is gonna have uh, different resources that you're coming to the table with for your site and you know different goals um, you know for where to spend your money but they don't have to be super expensive to get started three thousand dollars for that first year um, was a great place uh, to be and we were able to cover that 
local government per permitting, um, definitely encourage you to look into this very early in your planning process. Uh, it could be more in depth than you think it would be. Uh, depending on where you are, you may not need a permit um, here in Leon County uh, for any event where you expected more than 250 people, you need a special event permit. So uh, it's good to get on that uh, and start planning for that. Um, it can be a little frustrating, uh, but in the end, I think that the things that the permitting process brought to me were things that helped make it uh, a safer, well-planned event. Um, things like a written safety plan for the day. Who, who has the, the abilities to cancel the event? Who has um, all the responsibilities um, that are going on during the event? And, and what's your safety plan and fire evacuation routes and all that good stuff? Um, it, it forces you to think about that stuff. Uh, even down in some of the little details of recording the flame retardancy certificates for the tents that you use, um, you know, I would not have thought about that, uh, but it was good. Uh, and even into your porta potties, uh, do they have the licensing that they need? Um, do you have the Do you have them all lined up? Are you using the appropriate ratios uh, for the number of guests that you're expecting? Uh, and I'll let you all decide what that porta potty is holding there in his elf outfit. A site plan. Uh, this was a part of the permit requirements for Leon County special event permit. Um, even if you're not doing an event permit, I think a site plan is very, very helpful. Uh, and you don't have to be too fancy with it. Uh, this is a, a site plan from our first year. And I just made it in PowerPoint. Uh, it's a great graphics tool if you don't have uh, Photoshop or something fancier uh, in PowerPoint. You can put texts in boxes. You, know, you can drop your aerial photograph down. Um, you can get a lot of planning done um, just on a PowerPoint slide for uh, parking areas, all your general flow of the event where people are coming and going. It's also a good opportunity to think about your event layout and uh, how people are going to experience that. And I think creating kind of outdoor rooms using the equipment and the tents and all of these pieces really helps make for a, a comfortable event. And you know, that first year, if you don't know how many people are coming, you can kind of squeeze some of these areas. We had a huge lawn that this event is occurring on, but I squeezed it into several different smaller rooms um, by the positioning of things so that um, you could have a, a more crowded feel, uh, a vibrant event, kind of that festival event starting to happen uh, just by how you lay out things. Our second year, uh, this was just a different graphics program, uh, just a drawing app on my iPad uh, to lay things out. Um, but this slide gives you an example of some of the detail uh, that is really handy to have uh, as you're planning your layout, where everybody's gonna go, how many tables do they need, what tents do they need, where are your trash receptacles, where's your water table, um, and how are people getting around, how, what's the general flow uh, gonna be like. Uh, and I found that to be a very good planning tool um, in getting the event together. And then importantly, communicate when you've got 30 different partners out there, getting this uh, all to them so that when they show up on the day of the event, everybody knows where they're going, what tables they've got. Um, you know, our work crews know where to put the trash cans out, where to set up the drinking fountain tables, uh, all that good stuff. And a site plan is also helpful on the day of the event uh, for the people that are attending. Uh, our first year, we did four big posters that we put throughout the event um, to kind of let people know where everything was happening and then a schedule of when things were happening. Um, and I think that was very helpful. Unfortunately, people, even though they were huge, didn't see them. Um, so for the second year, uh, this is just a, a clipped version here in the slide. There's a schedule below the, the, uh, the image there. Uh, we made 15 small, like mini posters uh, on foam core that we put up at eye level all around the event. Uh, and that worked fantastic. Um, we didn't get nearly as many questions about where things were happening and, and what time and that uh, by putting up, kind of saturating the area with these mini posters. 
a nice lesson learned, you know, kind of in the permitting process, it was necessary to have a first aid station, which if you're hosting a big event, I think it's a great idea. And uh, we found that by approaching our volunteer fire department, um, that they were willing to do it for free. If we were using a uh, local ma emergency management service, um, there would have been a larger fee associated uh, with providing that service for the event. Um, so uh, a good relationship with your volunteer fire department is always great. Um, and group texting is kind of a nice, um, good communications cheat uh, for an event. Uh, everybody's got their cell phone. And so uh, on the day of the event, I would set up different group texts uh, for different parts of the event, and then a single group text uh, for all of the uh, major coordinators for each section of the event. Uh, and that allowed us to very quickly communicate um, during the event. Photographers, um, you know, these events are, are about outreach and education and getting the word out. And you can do, um, you know, sometimes just as much outreach and education with uh, the images and telling the story of your fire festival as you do for the people that attend your fire festival. And so photographs are hugely important for doing that. Uh, recruit volunteer photographers. There's a lot of great amateur photographers out there who would love to come uh, help you um, get as many as you can. I had, have used two and I wish I had even more, uh, but definitely assign that as a standalone task. Don't think that that's something that you can just put a camera in your pocket and take care of while you're running around coordinating things. A promotion plan uh, is definitely a must. Uh, to go through and think about how you're going to get people there. Uh, presence on the host website, presence on the websites of, of all the different partners that are working on it, uh, using those email lists um, that different groups have to, to pump out event invitations, uh, scour your community calendars, get it on there, uh, definitely do a press release. Uh, but a press release alone can fall pretty flat. So it's important to work your connections, you know, ask the folks on your planning group, if anybody has connections to local television, local radio, um, those personal connections with the information in the press release are really what's gonna get you moving forward faster. Uh, we had, you know, our local weatherman uh, there doing things. We were uh, on the uh, radio uh, the week before the event talking about it. Uh, and last but far from least is Facebook. Uh, we use Facebook heavily and Facebook has been really important for getting people there. Definitely having the event uh, on a host page, but also making your partners co-hosts of that event so that it shows up on everybody's Facebook page is huge. Uh, mentioning the Facebook, driving everybody to the Facebook page from the emails that you're sending, from the websites that you're using, and encouraging people to invite their friends, post it on their page, uh, really get it out there, um, and reminding the folks that are working on the event to be doing that a lot too, to get it out there. And then be willing to pay for some boosts. Uh, the Facebook boost is inexpensive and very effective. Uh, here's just kind of some numbers comparing our 2017 year to our 2018 year. Uh, with a $40 boost in 17 versus a $60 boost in 18, uh, we had a dramatic change in numbers. And a lot of that was just being a little more savvy with Facebook uh, and how we're doing the posts um, and, and really driving people to it. Uh, but another piece was uh, in 2018, our boost period was over the two week holiday period. And I think there's a lot of Facebook use during that period. And uh, if you're hosting an event that's going to be in January, getting that boost going uh, over the holidays uh, proved to be a, a huge bump for us. You definitely have to be ready for the surprises. Uh, in, in 2017, our first year, uh, we had a deadly tornado outbreak on the day of our event. Uh, luckily, we saw it coming. We were able to cancel a couple days in advance. But you know, when you cancel, there's lots of surprises that come forward. So our original band wasn't able to make our new date, so they had to cancel. And uh, 
and then flu season, we had an outbreak of that, and my five-piece uh, bluegrass band turned into a duet. So uh, you got to be ready to kind of roll with, uh, with some changes. Um, setting a rain date up front uh, it was a fundamental mistake uh, of not doing that. It was a fundamental mistake for our first year. We thought, we'll just set a date, we'll move it forward, and we'll deal with it from there. Uh, that led to a lot of extra work and uh, a lot of headache as we shifted that stuff around. Um, so for year two, we build that in. It's the next weekend. And all the partners and everybody knows that as you're moving forward. And uh, uh, I think that that was a, a big lesson learned. Uh, there are fun surprises too. This year, uh, right before our event, uh, the week before, a local artist contacted us and told us they had done a, an event poster for us. And it was beautiful and great. And we had them printed up and sold them at the event and uh, helped uh, cover some of the costs of the event. So uh, always good to have, uh, be ready for all kinds of surprises. Also good to have some fun out there. Uh, this was a selfie post uh, area that we created. Uh, it was just a picture of prescribed fire on a big easel um, with hashtag fire festival 2018 on it so folks can come by, uh, take their pictures, and post it on social media. Uh, a great way for people to let their friends know that they're there, they're having fun, and there's still time for them to come out and join you. Uh, I'd like to review kind of the event components that we used um, at the Red Hills Fire Festival. Uh, we had the prescribed fire demonstration, equipment demonstrations, guided tours, um, active exhibits, information tables, uh, talks or videos, I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, music, food and drink. So prescribed fire demonstrations are definitely the, the big show. This is a fire festival. This is what people are coming to see. This is the experience we want them to have. We want them to see good smoke management. We want them to to get a feel for how we're controlling those fires. People are fascinated by it. Uh, it's a great piece of the event. Uh, it's also the time where you have your biggest um, captive audience. And so everybody comes to gather to see this. And so this is the time to be delivering messages. And uh, we, stepped, we, we did some of that the first year uh, and really stepped it up the second year. We had a different speaker kicking off each of the burns uh, to talk about what their agency is doing, where they're going, you know, kind of deliver some, some key prescribed fire messages. And then move into uh, each year we had at least two people doing color commentary during the burn. So they're describing what's happening. So all of the steps, the types of fire that they're lighting, what they're seeing with the wind, uh, kind of a burn manager's um, rolling thinking of what they're watching and seeing um, so that people are, are kind of getting that. Uh, great chance for questions. Uh, it's also fun to mix up your burn teams a little bit. Uh, this past year we did three burns and we had a different burn team for each burn uh, to highlight all the different agencies partnering together. Uh, you can also have guests come in to light the fire. Uh, this was one of our raffle winners. We did a raffle to, to join the burn team for the day. Uh, and so it really gets people excited uh, to be part of that. Equipment demonstrations, uh, a great way uh, for a lot of different partners to get involved. Uh, fun piece at the event. Um, you got to push to try to get active parts to that. It's not just coming and parking these vehicles. It's staffing them. It's talking with people. Again, on that scale of education, this gives you an opportunity to have a, um, a closer one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, we had uh, uh, water jug races where we had the milk jugs up on lines and kids could come and squirt them with the fire hoses. Um, lots of different things you can do there to get it active. Uh, helicopters are great. Uh, they do take up a lot of space and they're never really confirmed until they're there. Uh, we had one our first year and we opted to not have one the second year uh, because we had to expand our tents so much to support all of the activities. Uh, that we started running out of room for the helicopter. Um, and there's always the scheduling issues too. Uh, if, you can, if you have the space uh, and coordinating one works for you, uh, it's a great addition to the event. Uh, guided tours, 
our nice part here at Tall Timbers, we have a fire managed forest right there where you can take people out. And again, a different scale of learning. You know, here you're down to about 20 people with someone talking. Um, you know, these could be done as walking tours if you don't have wagons, uh, but some way to get people out on the landscape um, to see what you're talking about in the woods. That way they can see not just fire, but they can see fire effects. The active exhibits uh, are a fundamental piece of the, of the festival atmosphere. This is getting those partners to come up with these activity ideas. Uh, this is our 2018 where we had uh, extra tents set up. Uh, and, and this is a hugely popular part of the event. This is where people can stroll and mingle and, uh, and learn uh, a little bit from all of our different partners. Uh, information tables, um, sometimes your partners don't have an activity and they, they just have uh, information that they wanna get out. Um, so certainly good to provide an opportunity for that, but you do wanna keep pushing active, 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 something to engage people. Uh, our first year we had talks uh, that we hosted. The second year we did movies. Um, uh, it was an opportunity for people to be inside for just a short bit. Um, uh, I think the movies worked pretty well. If it's a nice day, it's really hard to get folks to go inside. Live music, uh, I think that this really sets the tone for the event. Uh, you're not just standing around, you're listening to music. Uh, it, it makes it fun. Um, certainly find a local band, uh, just like with all your partners, they come with their own following, their own interests, and are another great way to um, expand the people that might be interested in coming to your event. And, and finally, food and drink. Uh, where we are uh, 20 minutes from anywhere, when people come for an event like this, they're pretty much all eating. And so uh, having the food trucks there thinking about your ratios of food trucks, how many people can they serve versus how many people uh, are you expecting? Uh, a lesson learned for us was to have at least one uh, really fast option. So we had Bradley's sausage dogs. Uh, it's not a made to order item, they're just on the grill. Folks can walk up and get them, helps keep the lines down. If people are just looking for something fast, that gets them there. Uh, results and feedback. Uh, this is a place where we could work on strengthening the Red Hills Fire Festival uh, and, and look forward to hearing some of what Angie's been doing um, with their festival. But we certainly comment forms uh, with the raffle that we did. We collected people's zip codes and email addresses as a way to continue to build our email uh, lists and the zip codes so we get an idea of how far folks are coming to the event. Uh, the, one of the most important things that we've done is formally soliciting that feedback from the folks who are working the event. They're out there, they're interacting with everybody who's coming to the event. Uh, they are seeing the opportunities for improvement. Uh, on results side, you know, your press coverage is, is an important part. And so collecting that, uh, documenting that, fostering it, making sure it happens, writing the article if you need to, uh, depending on the size of your local paper, um, they may be happy for you to write something and, uh, and get that out in front of them. Um, so, so collect and document those. And again, share them on, on Facebook and social media. And you know, you're, you're building your base for the next year as you're wrapping up the year that you're working on. And so with that, I think we can turn it over to Angie. All right, thanks so much, Brian. And uh, if you wanna hit stop sharing on your screen, and Angie, when you're ready to go, uh, go right ahead and share your screen and, and pull up PowerPoint. So um, we started out doing the festival in a little town called Boiling Spring Lakes. Um, it's in one of the fastest growing counties in the country. Um, so, you know, we were trying to get that message out. We ran that festival for four years, from 2010 to 2013. We tried many different things. Uh, we started the festival in February. And um, we'll skip to this slide. And as you can see, we got snowed on. Uh, we moved it to March. We got rained on. And we weren't getting a lot of participation from the group that we were organizing the festival with. And we were organizing it with the North Carolina Forest Service, who's always super helpful, but we also were working with the Boiling Spring Lakes Parks Department, 
which wasn't very helpful. And we were doing all the work and we were raising all the money for the sponsorships from going door to door to our local um, uh, businesses and, you know, with managing land and doing prescribed fire and also putting this festival on, it got to be a bit much. So we decided to move the festival. Um, we got sponsorship through some grants and through some foundations and we moved the festival to a higher, a denser population area. So we moved the festival to Wilmington, um, which depending on the snowbirds and the students and the tourists, we have about 120,000 people who live in this area now. And as you can see, we moved that festival in 2014 and we jumped from uh, less than a thousand participants to last year, we had about 5,000. Um, and we learned the same lessons of rain dates and, you know, we got Hurricane Matthew. So we moved the festival to October, which is the second driest month in North Carolina. And we've been successful three out of the four years now with, with the weather. So um, when we moved it to Wilmington, there was a higher denser population. And so we actually are not burning within the city of Wilmington much. And so our message changed and our audience changed too. And I think that's really important. Brian brought this up that you really should know what your message is and who you're actually targeting. And we, tar we decided we were gonna target elementary age student kids and their parents. And so that's where our audience changed. It wasn't the citizens of Boiling Spring Lakes anymore, it was kids. And um, and so we changed how we actually operated a little bit and, and changed our festival a little bit. And it's grown tremendously with those changes. So as you can see, um, we have a lot of people that come to our festival and the, the big issue for us is parking a lot of the years because we have to move people back and forth and our expenses are more because of that. We're, we're spending about $3,000 a year renting trolleys to move people back and forth, but the kids love that too. Um, our, our festival um, is all interactive and free besides the food trucks. This is our selfie station and we put clothes out there for kids to dress up in. Um, we want to draw in large crowds and we want to draw in everybody who can come. Um, everything we do is free. We have hay rides and, and lots of interactive booths and free face painting and all kinds of things for the kids. Um, so our weather is always important. Like Brian said, location's important. Um, our partnerships are important. The North Carolina Forest Service uh, is in charge of the fire and they bring their equipment every year like they do down in Florida. Um, we have helicopters on some years. We have the trucks, we have the dozers. Um, a really cool thing they're doing now um, are building a, a, a gas flame over water where the kids can actually spray the flame out. Um, they got that idea from a demonstration of uh, fire extinguishers. So that's really exciting. Um, when we invite partners to come do the festival, we ask them to do interactive things too, whether it's some sort of sensory uh, experience for the kids. And so they're planting and they're um, touching animals and, and, and um, building things and, and crafts, we have a crafts tent that we actually put up ourselves and they get to make fire crowns and Venus flytrap puppets. And so all of our partners are really excited. It's probably the best kids festival in the area and they often stated that. Um, so, and our supportive sponsors are really important for us too. Um, we're writing grants and getting sponsorships. Our budget annually at this point is between 12 and $15,000 is what we're spending on the festival and most of it is donated money the nature conservancy puts a little bit in from ops but most of it is uh it's it's recurring funds that keep coming every year um so making a festival fun and educational is super important 
getting kids back, getting parents back, building your base, um, and making sure you have plenty of food available. We learned that lesson the hard way. People left early because their kids were hungry, and um, so we have lots of food trucks, and that's the only thing in the festival that's not free. Um, but also, you know, again, stressing what Brian stressed, partnerships and, and having people to do things. We don't just have partners. We actually hire an intern every year um, who helps us plan the festival. And we've hired the same person for the last three years. And it's made it a lot easier to have that reoccurring person come. She takes care of the media. She sets everything up. Um, all I have to do at this point is pay the bills. And so it's it's taken a lot of stress off of our staff and off the park staff and, and the forest service staff. Um, so our committee meets once a month, usually, except for right before the festival. And uh, we usually start up in April or around April to set up for the October festival. And um, So when the when people arrive at our festival, they get off the trolley or they come in. We, we're on a bike path through Wilmington, or they walk in from the art museum, or they walk in from the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we have a information booth set up at the very front um, to greet people, and we have um, a lot of volunteers. We have about 40 volunteers through the university and through other local um, businesses that send their um, staff to volunteer for us. And uh, when we greet them, we give the kids a scavenger hunt and we give all of our, um, all of our organization stickers and the kids go around. So they're actually interacting with the booths and they have to interact to get the stickers. And they ask questions of all, all the booths have stickers and they can all answer all the questions. And it's very simple, but then they get a, a prize at the end. And so it gets the kids really you know, engaged with, with the people in the booths. And at the same time, we have a survey. And when we were in Boiling Spring Lakes, we were trying to get a lot of information. And Toddy Steelman, who was with NC State at the time, created a survey for us. Um, we since tweaked it quite a bit to get information for our festival, but we have about three to $4,000 worth of prizes for adults to win if they fill out the survey for us. And so we're getting super, so we're having a uh, high success of getting these surveys filled out and they get a free raffle ticket. And um, it's giving us information on, you know, are we moving the needle on fire and, and you know, what's their perception of fire, but it's also giving us information and feedback on our media outreach and, uh, and our demographics and, and who's actually coming to the festival. And, that's information that's really helping us guide how we're, we're working on the festival and what we're doing. Um, it's guiding our uh, our media outreach and you know what we've learned and what Brian said is so we're spending you know about a thousand dollars a year on media outreach or we were and we were we were spending on television, radio ads and a little bit on Facebook and what we've got gained from our surveys is that about 40% uh, of our, our, our participants are actually our attendees are finding out on Facebook or through word of mouth um, and like maybe 5% radio and 5% television not to take away from what the television and, and the radio are getting us though because you know, we're actually getting our messages out. We're we're doing interviews with the television stations that are sponsoring us, and they're and they're putting us giving us a lot of media time. So, you know, we're not just reaching the people that actually attend the festival. We're reaching other people as well, and um, it's also started to change the way that the weather people on the station talk about fire. They're like, oh, it, that's a plume coming out of Holly Shelter and don't worry about it it's a controlled burn which is really good for the environment so you know we're we're changing the way that people are talking about fire in our area and it's it's a, been a big benefit for that reason uh, we also noticed in the last few years that we're skewing towards wealthier and wealthier families coming in so another change that we've made 
is that prior to the festival, um, the week before, we actually do outreach to um, the, the students, the fourth and fifth graders at the, the, um, the schools that actually have the most free school lunches going out. And it's turned into a really big, it was a really big success last year. We reached about 200 students on that one day and we brought in partners who were actually coming to the festival who were doing some really interactive things with the kids. We were peeping woodpecker holes and uh, we had a Django forest and, and uh, fire and it, it was amazing. And um, what we learned about that though is next year we're actually gonna get some volunteer Spanish translators to actually help um, do some better outreach with that. But um, that's what we're gaining from the surveys and the, and the scavenger scavenger hunts are just interactive, but the surveys are really giving us a lot of information. And I would encourage any of you who are thinking about doing a festival or are currently doing a festival, we would love to share our survey with you and actually to pool the information we get across the Southeast or across the country even, it, you know, on how effective these, these messages are getting out to people. So if anybody is interested, um, you know, you can email me and I will send you that. Um, we're working, we were working with a professor who is actually running the data for us and we're actually looking now for someone to take that up. So if you know of any, um, anybody who is interested in fire communication, we would love to work with them. We're, we're talking with UNCW right now because they're right here at our back door, but we haven't, haven't found quite, we haven't found the right fit yet. So um, that's my plug for that. Uh, with the media, we're doing, like I said, we're doing web Facebook pushes just like Brian's doing. Um, we're, we're paying about $120 versus the $300 we're paying for radio and the $500 we're paying for television and getting a big push. On the day of, we have a Snapchat filter, which I think we paid $15 for and created ourselves. We've got our website, and that was initially a big expense getting it set up, but the maintenance of it is it's fairly fairly cheap and we're doing most of it ourselves. Um, last year for the first year, we hired a professional photographer. So a lot of these amazing photos you're seeing are um, coming from, from that uh, professional photographer. We've had some great photos from volunteer people, but it's brought it up to a whole new level hiring that professional because like Brian said, you know, this is, this is our, our outreach and, and, it's really important. And one of our sponsors actually came to us and said, hey, we'd like to give you more money to hire a professional photographer. So that's why we did it. Um, and it's, it's really paid out. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, um, when we actually do the burn, which we've done most of the years, we get guest celebrities to actually come and light the fire. We've had uh, our weather people come in and start the fire. This is the guy in the background pushing Miss Wheelchair USA is actually the mayor of the town. And he actually ended up, after she lit the initial fire, ended up lighting the whole entire burn. Um, and uh, he loves it and he talks about it in city council meetings all the time that it's one of his favorite things to do every year so um and having the weather person come and do it one year you know changed her perspective on fire and so it's great photo opportunities and it is great um to to do outreach to your local politicians or um, we've been trying to get Drew Barrymore to come because Firestarter was actually filmed in Wilmington and we always thought that would be great, but that has not happened. Maybe this year. And so the other key to our success is our partnerships. Um, the North Carolina Forest Service, again, has been partnering with us through both of the, the festival, both iterations of the festival. Um, and they've been key, uh, you know, they actually take control of doing all the fire stuff and have been, and, and have been super supportive about everything that we do and working with the city parks in Wilmington has been amazing. They have a lot of resources and a lot of staff and, a, and you know, they're, they're environmental educators. And so it's 
been great to have them on board too. Um, they staff the hay rides, they do all the parking stuff, and, and so we don't even have to have volunteers for any of that stuff. It's all it's all staff, and um, which is great. And we have our own safety protocols and safety programs too, and they've helped out quite a bit with that as well. Um, and then the other organizations that come out and you know they're really game to do a lot of interactive things. Kids get to spray uh, flames that spin around and get their face painted. We hired the last two years we've or the last year we also hired professional face painters and came up with amazing results as you can see. Uh, Spider-Man was big last year and we had a lot of Spider-Man uh, faces and you can see the kid in the background with the pirate. He's you know kids loved that and we had a lot of animals and and, and again it's a sensory thing for kids and it was great. So um, so with that, uh, the other important part is the sponsors. And you can see that we actually make signs and, and had our we have one of our staff members actually go around and take pictures and actually videos saying thank you to our sponsors and that they can use as promotion for themselves. Um, and so Without that sponsorship, this festival could not be as big as it is. And without the partners that we have bringing it in, it wouldn't be as special as it is. And without the team that we have created um, between uh, the, the Nature Conservancy, the city parks, and the North Carolina Forest Service, this would not happen. Um, so, yeah, that's what I've got for you. All right. Thanks, Angie. That was uh, great. And you're right. Those are some pretty amazing photos that you guys uh, got out of those events. Uh, so we have time uh, left in our hour. Uh, so if you guys have um, any questions for our speakers, uh, you can go ahead and start either typing them into the chat window or into the Q&A window. And, uh, and we will go through and, and uh, address those. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen here so that you guys can see the contact information for our speakers. So if you want to. Uh... Great. Great. There. David, yep. David, while you're doing that, I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of things that Angie mentioned um, that I think were, were worth repeating again. Um, the greeting station. Uh, I think that it we do that also, and I think it's a key piece of as people come in, you're funneling them through an area you're welcoming them, you're orienting them to the event, and you're counting them. It's a great way to get a head count for your event. Um, and when it comes to food, including a dessert truck of some sort is a great thing to do. Um, we had it our first year. We had somebody cancel our second year, so we didn't have it. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, kids who eat sugar in an event have families that will stay longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that's a good point. And uh, Angie, how did you guys track your attendance numbers? Uh, we were, we had people out counting with clickers and we were counting up people on and off trolleys and uh, we had people at parking area counting as well. So, okay. You had sort of a team of folks catching. Yeah. And it, you know, we're rough guessing what, what we what, what we were, but yeah, we're, we feel pretty good about our numbers. Okay, we here's a, a few questions that we had come in. Uh, ben asked about uh, insurance, and then he kind of further elaborated. Do you have a policy that covers the entities who are volunteering their time and effort, uh, as in folks who are setting up or or uh, hosting booths? Um, from our from our uh, festival, no, we don't have a policy that covers entities volunteering. Um, and the insurance is covered by the city because it's on the city parks land. And so they actually host these events all the time and um, have a policy for that. And at, and at Tall Timbers, we're using our site insurance um, here, uh, but it doesn't specifically cover the people who are volunteering. Okay. And here's a question we had that came in from Jen. Uh, she asks, and 
and I was thinking about this too. Uh, Angie, I think hit on it, but I didn't catch it for Brian. You know, how far in advance do you guys start the planning process for one of these events? As early as you can. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the earlier, the, the easier. Yeah, I think, um, you know, probably six months out um, is, is probably a minimum um, to be able to get enough partners participating, get the date on the calendar for everybody. Uh, if you go shorter than that, um, it's going to be rough. Um, yeah, and for us, you know, the more we do it, the less time it actually takes. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. So, uh, I mean, we were used to, we were doing it year round planning for the next one, but now it's probably about seven months in advance. And I would say, like, the first few festivals you have are going to be a lot more work than as you progress and you you have like a, a, a you have already thing or every setup you already have your contacts and all that stuff so it gets easier mm -hmm. so uh you guys both have done burns at these events and how many acres are you burning do you think that there is a, a minimum or a maximum or do you think there are characteristics that make for a, a good burn site uh we're burning a quarter of an acre mm -hmm. so we're not burning much and we're burning the same site annually and we've actually planted wire grass in there so that it actually we can see the the, the flowering and the grasses and um it it doesn't take much and it's easy just to do a small burn mm -hmm. and, and is that a in a it's a, in a city park yeah surrounded by communities busy streets a mall it, I mean, yeah, it's 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 um, a difficult place to burn, anyways. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's the same site every year, and the mayor knows what to do now. So, <laughs> <laughs> he's got the ignition plan down. Does yeah. um, so is, do you have people all around the unit, or do you keep folks into one particular viewing area? So there's a sidewalk in front. And so we make everybody stand behind the sidewalk and then there's a playground to the other one side. Um, it's densely forested, it's on two sides. And so they're just strung out along, um, for ours, along all the sides of in, in, yeah, there's plenty of room for people to see it. And how about, how about you, Brian? Could you talk about the burn locations? Sure. Um, I think we're burning maybe two acres total um, chopped into three different units. And um, so again, not very large. Um, the key is high visibility for the people at the event. Um, the way our site is set up, there's only one side that I can have folks on, um, which works for controlling them. Um, but it means that your wind needs to be coming from, uh, from one direction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, otherwise you're putting smoke over folks, um, which we had a little bit of in, in the 2018 event. Um, but I would say small and highly visible so that they can see what's happening. Um, I think people are fascinated by watching um, the different ignitions and how the fire comes together and how it goes out. Uh, and so small enough that they can see that all happen without moving their feet is great. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds, makes sense. We had a couple of questions come in. Uh, Debbie says, you know, she, she says Sar Sarasota County has provided food and burgers or hot dogs at our annual fire fest every year so far. And we started them in 2014. She says, how easy is it to get food trucks to come out to your event? And, and do you have any information? Has it been profitable for those food trucks who came out? For our festival, mm -hmm. um, it's, so we have, a, a certain limit that we can have food trucks there without them having to pay a fee to the city. Um, we're trying to get that up because it keeps growing and I think we need more trucks. Every year the food trucks complain about how many food trucks we invite and every year thus far we've sold out, they've sold out of all of their food and have been extremely happy at the end of the day. And they all complain about their sighting and where they are and they're not visible enough and at the end of the day like oh we were in the best spot so yeah. <laughs> yeah, we haven't had any problem um, getting food trucks. I um, 
quite honestly just pick ones that I like and invite them. Um, and, uh, you know, in thinking about the mix of food that you want to have there, I mean, you want people to have a good time. And uh, uh, we don't pay them anything. We just invite them to come. They don't pay us anything. Um, and uh, much as Angie's experience, you know, they've, they've done well, have been happy, and have always wanted to come back. So um, it, it's been a... Oh, I will mention that we have a food truck association in Tallahassee. Um, so looking to see if there is a food truck association uh, is a great way to find all of them on one website if you don't have favorites that you already want to invite um that may be a good avenue all right so uh we've come up to the end of our hour and and we'll go ahead and hit one more question that came in and this person just sort of a general question says could you describe the process of identifying a new location or host site so if if you guys were to think about somebody in the audience or someone who's thinking about starting a fire fest from scratch and they were looking to pick a location. Um, what's your suggestion? My suggestion is when we moved our festival, we were looking at several different things. We were looking at population density and where we were gonna get the most outreach. We were looking at um, capacity of the, the areas and we were looking for willing partners. And that's like the, the, the three big things for us. We had several several options, and um, one of them had better parking, and one of them had better population density, and we went with the population density, which has been a headache for the parking, but I think it's been really worth it seeing the, the outreach we're actually, the numbers we're getting. I'll chime in and say that I haven't had to think of it because I work for an organization that has the land and has the facility, and so it was a no-brainer. Um, but in preparing for this talk and talking with Angie, um, the idea of a more urban setting where folks aren't having to drive 20 minutes from anywhere to get to us um, would really open the lid on how many people we could get to attend and how many people we could reach. So uh, I, I would second that thought of uh, pushing into an urban area um, for your event. All right. Well, well, thank you so much to both of you. It looks like we've run up to the end of our time today. So I'd like to thank again, Angie and Brian. Thank you for your presentations. Thanks for joining us. And for those of you who've logged on, as we close out the webinar today, we do ask that you please take just a couple of minutes to fill out the short questionnaire that will open up in your browser window. And let us know your thoughts on the webinar today and how we might share improve our future webinars to meet your fire science needs. And we share those results and that feedback uh, with our speakers. So Brian and Angie will be able to get the, the comments, the feedback or any questions you may have, you can, you can leave that and that uh, survey that pops up. Today's webinar was recorded and it will be archived for later, later viewing on the Southern Fire Exchange YouTube channel. And uh, so if you had some friends who couldn't join us today, uh, that link will will be posted in a couple weeks. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks again, Brian and Angie. And uh, we hope that this webinar will be useful in your fire management and outreach uh, programs. So have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.